Hello and welcome to the print. My name is Soumya Pillai, and we are in conversation with a very special guest today, Union Minister of Science and Technology, Space, Atomic Energy, Earth Sciences, and a long list of portfolios, Dr. Jitender Singh. Uh, thank you for joining us at the print today, thank sir. Thank, thank you, Samia. Uh, sir, jumping right to the questions, uh, we have had the fortune of speaking to you just a few days after the cabinet has passed rupees uh, thousand crores in venture capital fund for uh, improving the space sector. Uh, very recently, the Bio E three policy was also launched. So a lot is happening on the science and tech front. Uh, so what is the long term plan that the government has for uh, you know encouraging the science and tech in India? No, thank you. First of all, thank you, Somia, for having me here. And uh, picking up from where you left, I think uh, all these uh, different uh, achievements or different initiatives that you mentioned happened very recently. So, to put it in other words, this is part of the first 100 days of Modi government 3.0 story. So, I'm glad even uh, my possibly didn't occur to me that intensely until you pointed out. So, there's been this startup venture fund of 1000 crore rupees. There's been bio E3 policy in biotechnology. At the same time, there is Mission Mossum in the Ministry of Earth Sciences and IMD. So, all this, so which other words, which in other words is an indication of the high priority that this government, the Prime Minister himself gives to science, technology, innovation and also to push forward all the scientific ventures uh, in order to enable them to meet the global standards. So I think having said that now the second part of course, each of this has a story to tell, which is very much linked with how the government has been functioning over the last 10 years under Prime Minister Modi with a huge shift in priorities and also a great uh, uh, concern for the timelines. Now, as far as space is concerned, I think uh, one day historians will uh, try to analyze why for almost six, seven decades we have to uh, work behind a wheel of secrecy which actually limited our progress. We didn't have any dearth of talent, we didn't have any dearth of uh, capabilities, competencies. We had someone like Vikram Sarabhai, Steve Savan, the world-class space scientist, uh, operating at a time when India was quite devoid of resources. But unfortunately, we didn't have the kind of support or the enabling uh, assistance which is expected from the political dispensation, which happened after Prime Minister Modi came in. And when this was put across to him that uh, space sector had an immense potential to grow if it was opened up for a wider participation. And I'm glad that uh, since he has the capacity, the courage, the conviction to take out of box decisions, he allowed us to open the space sector to the private participation and just within three or four years since it has happened, it's been a quantum jump. We were just one digit space startup. Today we are nearly 300 space startups. Some of them are world class. And I think keeping that in mind and, and feeling encouraged from this experience was this decision also motivated to have this 1000 rupees, uh, 1000 crore venture fund exclusively for the space startups because we also now and we saw that the years to come, space economy is going to play an important part in the overall economic growth of the country because from fragile five that we were before 2014, now we've gone to top five. And as the Prime Minister keeps saying that we will soon be number four, then number three, and then of course reaching number uh, the rank one. But that value addition will come from these resources, which of course includes the space, also includes the biotech sector, which you mentioned. So similarly also, I'm proud to say and I'm also glad to say that Prime Minister allowed us to come out with this Bio E3 policy, which is uh, quite a quite an out of box decision in the sense that uh, many com many of the countries and many nations have not yet uh, woken up to this new area, which is uh, upcoming in a very fast way. Because we believe that the next industrial revolution, and that's I think also view of many of the economies across the world, that the next 
um, industrial revolution is going to be bioeconomy driven in the same manner as the last industrial revolution which happened in 1990s was IT driven. Now that sector having been almost saturated, exhausted, now with the turn of the economy shifting from manufacturing to recycling to synthesis to uh, lab based production which will also make us self dependent like for example um, our 80 percent or so of fuel resources from the petroleum so we have to depend on the petroleum rich countries but once we are into the biotech sector in a big way we will be able to convert waste into fuel so biofuel so all these things so considering that we have now in place very recently approved by the cabinet headed by the prime minister bio e3 which means biotechnology for environment biotechnology for economy biotechnology for employment so you can see these three important aspects being addressed by a single policy and these are all the three very futuristic aspects these are the aspects which the entire world today is globally trying to address and we also have a huge huge natural resource of uh, bio uh, economy in the sense that we have rich Himalayan resources, we have a uh, number of states lying in the lap of Himalayas beginning from Jammu Kashmir, Himachal, Uttarakhand, Arunachal, etc. We have a long coastline 7500 kilometers about uh, 11, 12 states on the coast beginning from Orissa, Bengal up to Maharashtra, Gujarat like that and that resource also uh, will have a lot of to, uh, lot of it to do with the biotechnology because a lot of bio resources inside, fishery inside, all these things have not been explored. So this is going to give a huge, huge addition to India's uh, economic growth. Uh, sir, since you were uh, speaking about space and India's space ambitions, uh, Gaganyaan is one of the missions that uh, is in the pipeline, soon to be launched. Very recently, the government also gave a green signal to the Venus mission. So, uh, is it possible to get some timelines of how we are headed towards these bigger missions in the future? Yeah, you are right. Actually, Gaganyaan is… Uh, the very prospect of Gaganyaan already has given India a place of esteem in the world arena because till about I say 20 years ago we were not taken very seriously as well as our space uh, initiatives were concerned for a number of reasons including the constraint of resources which I was just mentioning a few moments ago. But now particularly after the Chandrayaan achievement since we became the first to land on the southern pole of moon. India's capabilities have now been acknowledged across the world. India is now not only at par with the other countries, in many ways than one, it is also able to offer cues, inputs for others to uh, plan, design their projects. So that is the difference now. So as far as Gagarian is concerned, we are already into trial flights because there are three components. One is the cockpit, the other is operative part, the third is coming back because uh, as just as sending up uh, a human crew is uh, very crucial, equally crucial or critical is getting it back safe and sound in the water. So, after this series of test flights are over, then we'll have one final robo-driven flight, which you can describe in common parlance as the final dress rehearsal. So, we'll have a female robo who's been named Voyomitra. She'll perform all those activities, all those tasks which are going to be performed by the actual human being when he goes up. And after that has been accomplished successfully and she's back safe and sound, then of course the main, the actual human flight will happen possibly in 2025. So, the schedule as of now is 2025. So, if you are uh, not able to have the final robo flight this year, maybe the next year, in the later part of the year, uh, actual Gaganya. So, you spoke about the space advancements and you spoke about bio manufacturing. Uh, yesterday, there was this very interesting MOU that was signed, which was almost sort of bringing the two together. There was also a two days back an MOU signed uh, with uh, Germany on, uh, you know, uh, bringing together the partnerships. If you could highlight a little bit about no, those actually, partnerships. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I think it's <coughs> also been a great priority of the government and uh, personally that of Prime Minister Modi. He's been always talking about whole of government. So, as far as science, technology, innovation is concerned, unless we have whole of science together, we would not be able to meet the target of whole of government. So, it has to be whole of science, then whole of government, then of course whole of nation and whole of society, if we want to achieve the uh, 
optimum results. So, I think one good thing which happened soon after this game, government came in, and that was I think year 2015 or 16, which set the tone for the rest of the science departments also. There was, at the behest of Prime Minister himself, there was two or three days of brainstorming which took place in Vigyan Bhavan. Representatives of different ministries were made to sit with space scientists and made to realize where all they could bring in space technology. Because the ultimate objective of uh, any scientific um, any scientific option is not simply to launch rockets or to experiment in laboratories, but how far it can bring ease of living the life of a common citizen. And that we have accomplished doing better than many other countries. So, for example, our space technology uh, is no longer limited only to the launching of rockets, which is a very small component of overall what is happening in space technology. Because, for example, space technology is now very much into smart cities, roads, buildings, railway crossings, telemedicine, agriculture in a very, very big way, mapping of land farms, etc. So, so also, so bringing biotechnology and space together is going to open a new era of space biology. Because when you have astronauts going into the space, what will be their uh, biophysiology and how will the, uh, the body and the various physiological phenomena behave and how best to manage them. So that's one part. The other part is when when the space inputs or samples come back to the earth, how best to analyze them. So again, the biotechnologies. So it's, it's, it's going to be two ways. So the space technology, it's space scientists would require the assistance of the biotechnology scientists and the biotechnology scientists will be looking forward to space scientists. And the union of the two is going to actually benefit both and then bring out a larger results. Now, for example, in the times to come, the biotechnologists are of the opinion that you might even be able to uh, prepare uh, maybe water or even cook meals uh, with fuel from the atmosphere, from the vapors that are happening. So that is biotechnology. But the vapors are happening in the, not in the outer space, maybe in the inner space, but still. So there's so much of uh, interlinkage of the various streams of science. And there also comes the life sciences how best to deal uh, health-wise with all these uh, conditions in which these uh, human beings are going to function. So I think that MOU is important from that point of view also. And uh, we have a huge foreign collaboration, including the German collaboration, uh, which uh, was actually reviewed very recently, as you rightly mentioned. Uh, we have uh, almost 50,000 Indian young scholars uh, following different courses, different projects in Germany itself. So Germany has emerged as one of the preferred destination for the Indian youth. So I think that's important. Uh, so you were back uh, with the Ministry of Earth Sciences after a while and we recently had the Mission Mossam uh, clearance. So for the longest time, uh, the Med Department had this notorious image of never really getting the forecast right. But recently we are seeing that, you know, there's a lot of policy and technology push to sort of change that image. So if you could tell us a little bit about what all is happening on that front. Yeah, actually going back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, the kind of uh, prioritization happening at the level of the political government. I think before 2014, for many years, this department did not receive the kind of attention it deserved. Maybe the governments then did not find it very important. So much so that the weather forecasts which were being uh, broadcast on the radio also became an object of humor. Uh, because uh, it was said that if they say that the weather is going to be bad or weather is going to be rainy, take it for granted, it will not happen, it will happen the other way around. So, it was not taken seriously at all. And that is because we were among the first to enter into this arena. Can you imagine we our uh, meteorological department is 150 years old. It was set up after that one of those catastrophes which happened in the Northeast somewhere in the 1875 uh, during the British Empire. Uh, so we have a long history, but maybe after independence, we did not push it the manner it deserved without realizing that it has a huge impact on our agriculture sector. So we are an agriculture dominant country. So it has such a huge relevance. Besides, of course, the convenience of having a weather forecast, it has a huge bearing on the 
prospects of our crops, the kind of crops that we are going to have uh, and the kind of damage which can be avoided by a proper forecast. And I'm glad now, of course, Mission Mossam is very recent. It was launched within the first 100 days of Modi government 3.0, uh, 3.0. Now we are going to have, and we've already started that. Earlier on, the weather forecast was mainly based on radar. Now we have a combination of space technology. So there again, we are combining the different uh, streams of science. Then we are upgrading our equipments. I'm sure after this mission, we are going to have uh, global standards as far as forecasts are concerned. We are also now in a position to provide forecasts to six or seven neighboring countries, including Bangladesh, Nepal, Mauritius, Maldives, um, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. Uh, in fact, many a time we have been able to forewarn countries like Nepal about an impending disaster. So now in a single sentence, the basic mantra is not what will be the weather tomorrow. It is what will the weather do tomorrow. Which means, I mean, it was always customary out of courtesy, you would say, how's the weather? Now you will say, what is the weather doing or going to do? So you could actually prepare yourself. So what will the weather do in case the rainfall is going to be so many centimeters? What are the likely outcomes of it and how, how best you can avoid that? So this new paradigm in the entire thinking process, thought process has happened now. Now in India, what was happening is, which we took many of the concerned people time to realize that possibly we didn't have the kind of patronage from the uh, leadership before Prime Minister Modi came in. India is very heterogeneous and our cities are now expanding. Like for example, the NCR, National Capital Region is no longer the Delhi of the year. So it's, I mean, you call it Delhi, but it's gone far beyond. Uh, the, some of those areas which were uh, villages, which were totally rural till about 20 years back or even 30 years back have now turned, uh, come up with whole huge mansions and malls. So it's expanded. And our weather equipment at that time was possible, possibly meant to cater for the city. But when you start making forecasts, which are assumed to be applicable even beyond a certain range, then there is a room for error. So we are going to make of that. We have these automatic stations, which are, which were not enough in numbers as far as the NCR Delhi is concerned. We are going to make up for that. We already started purchases. We already started putting them in place. So that when, in that case, we would be able to give the forecast with a <coughs> greater accuracy. In addition, we have now also gone into the most modern technologies. Like for example, we have WhatsApp groups, we have uh, apps, and uh, we have something called weather anywhere, anytime, in the sense that if you're going to another place and your stay is for two days, you can draw out a chart of what, even hour-wise, for the next 36 hours, you can have an hourly forecast. And if you're going to stay there for five days and after 36 hours, it'll be maybe three hourly, then after five days, 10 days, it will be six hourly. So, so precisely and the time is going to get shorter. In addition, we are also in the process, we will be glad to know developing a chat box uh, dedicated only to uh, weather and uh, the various implications of weather. It could even tell you that weather in so and so month is going to be so and so in this way and therefore, um, the soil there where you are located is not compatible for this kind of crop. So, we are now synchronizing and creating an ecosystem where we don't remain confined only to the forecast system. We are uh, combining all the technologies, including the IT technology, including the artificial intelligence to achieve the accuracy as much as possible. Thank you, sir, for speaking with us. Uh, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in for this interview. You were with Soumya Pillai and behind the camera is video journalist Devesh Singh.